is dedicated to promoting reading success for all. We attack illiteracy from three angles. We give teachers evidence-based strategies to teach reading. We provide parents of struggling readers with support and information. And we teach adults to read. Giving the kids the Nye House strategies and letting them know that they can compete with anyone, that's our passion. Hi, I'm Dr. Allison Peck, Vice President of Professional Development here at Nye House Education Center. And I'm Laura Spates, the Vice President of Family Support and Adult Literacy at Nye House. I'm the parent of a child with dyslexia, and I have taken this journey with my own family. I've served as a general education and special education teacher, as well as a case manager in the public and private school realms for almost 20 years. I've also been a private dyslexia therapist, starting with my own child and then working with many other students and their families. I'm also a licensed dyslexia therapist, and prior to joining Nye House, I worked for over a decade in Texas public schools supporting struggling readers and their families. Today, we're going to talk with you about empowering your dyslexic child. So maybe you're here today because you think your child might have dyslexia and you want to learn more. Maybe you're here because your child is going to get evaluated for dyslexia. Maybe you had that initial 504 or ARD meeting and you're feeling a little bit overwhelmed. Or maybe you've known for years that your child has dyslexia and they're still struggling significantly. Whatever the reason, we welcome you here today. And we want you to know we intentionally created this session to work for a variety of families in a variety of different situations. And so you might feel that some information is more relevant or less relevant for you. And that's okay, right? Take what works for you, make it work for you. We also hope that you leave feeling affirmed. You are doing a good job and you are the person best positioned to advocate for your child. Please know that you are not alone in this journey and if after this presentation you have additional questions or just want to talk something through, please contact us at Nye House. We have family support coordinators who are here and ready to speak with you. And so we wanted to begin today with a classic quote from Dr. Sally Shaywitz, the author of Overcoming Dyslexia. She writes, dyslexia is merely an island of weakness surrounded by a sea of strengths. So dyslexia typically manifests with the difficulty of decoding. But as you can see on the wheel, oftentimes a child with dyslexia is going to have remarkable strengths in other areas, such as critical thinking, comprehension. And so whenever I think about this quote, I think about a seventh grader who I was working with. And at the beginning of the pandemic, he wasn't showing up for his online classes, wasn't submitting work, and so it got to the point where this child was failing everything. And by failing, right, it just meant he had submitted zero work. And so part of it was technology, you know, we got him connected with a laptop. Part of it was then needing to learn how to work a laptop and having the literacy level to navigate the laptop. So we worked through all of that and so we finally got to the moment weeks later where we were gonna have our intervention session. And so I'm here ready to go, you know, we've got a lot to do. And the first thing he says is, Ms. Fates, can I show you what I've been working on? And I'm like, yes, let's go, what do you have for me? And he pulls out, I kid you not, a museum quality piece of art that he had clearly been putting dozens and dozens of hours and time and focus and effort into. And that moment has stayed with me because it was kind of humbling, right? I came here with my to-do list, here we go, we've got things to do. And I was quickly reminded, oh wait, this is not a failing student. This is a brilliant student. Yes, he needs help in certain areas, but that in no way defines the core and the essence of who he is. And so that's what I want us to really keep in mind again today, a sea of strengths. And so looking at our time together today, we're going to start off um, by talking about you as an adult. So how to empower yourself, both by processing the diagnosis yourself 
and building your knowledge so that you can then take that and empower your child. And we're going to give you concrete steps for doing that. And then we'll end with what next steps could look like if, again, despite your best efforts, it's not working. So you receive the initial dyslexia diagnosis. What to do? You and other important adults in your child's life need to take time to process this diagnosis so that you can then be in a positive headspace to empower your child. You also need to allow your child to process this information. I was in quite a few ARD committee meetings where middle school students and their families when they received this initial diagnosis of dyslexia. I also vividly remember sitting in the office of the educational psychologist when my husband and I received the dyslexia diagnosis for my own child. Getting a dyslexia diagnosis or even just having a suspicion that your child may have a learning difference can lead to a range of emotions, from relief to fear to excitement to confusion to sadness. All of those emotions are valid. And if you aren't okay with the diagnosis yet, that's okay too. But you will need to reach the point of leaning into those emotions for yourself and the other important adults in your child's life before you will be in a position to powerfully empower your child. I know for myself, I went through a period of sadness and despair as I thought my child's future and their potential would not be the same as I had once imagined. I had to come to terms that my beautiful sweet child would always struggle to read. Even with the right interventions in place, this would be a lifelong struggle. But then I armed myself with all of the best information I could find so I could make informed and positive decisions for him and for our family as a whole. If you haven't yet, you need to really consider how you feel about this. If, for example, you're embarrassed, even if you don't say those words, your child will pick up on that and then transfer those feelings to his or her self-concept. And the same goes for the other important adults in the child's life. Everyone needs to be on the same page about what this diagnosis means for your child and how you will approach it as a team and speak about it. Besides naming your emotions, you also want to look and really listen. Understanding what the warning signs for dyslexia are can be very powerful. This can be especially helpful to talk through with other adults and your child's teachers. First, I would like to say that family history is real. Schools may not always ask about this, so be sure that you share if your child has a family history of dyslexia or other reading disorders. This is a little recreation of the family tree that I married into. I love my English family, but there is a long and strong line of family members with dyslexia. This line of the generation above and below my husband and I all happen to be males and that have been identified with dyslexia. I am Allison, who is married to Stuart. He is dyslexic. I did not know this until we had our first child. Our first child named Jeremy started to show language difficulties early on, early in the preschool years. Jeremy was identified as having indicators of dyslexia in late kindergarten and formally diagnosed a year later. And looking back to when I met my husband in college, I just thought he was a bit quirky and I actually liked helping him write papers in college. But little did I know he had developed amazing coping strategies and can maneuver college really well. He was also a college athlete, so he had access to tutors and a learning center that provided him with accommodations for his dyslexia. My husband is now 51, and it still pains him to talk about his third grade year in elementary school where he was placed in a special education classroom because he couldn't read. It took them an entire year to realize it was actually dyslexia. He never received remediation for it, but rather had more of everything, more tutors for English and math and science. As you can see, his father and two uncles also had dyslexia. His dad grew up in Manchester, England, and when they reached about the equivalent of high school there, around ninth grade, they would take exams to see if they would go to university or trade school. His dad was forced into the trade school route because he couldn't pass the exam. He ultimately became a draftsman. He eventually worked for an oil company here in the United States and had such amazing people skills and understanding of the oil fields and all the processes that went on behind it that he became part owner of the company and then eventually owned oil companies on two different continents. When our son was diagnosed with dyslexia, my husband was devastated, but I knew that times had progressed and there was much more information and remediation programs available. So I set myself in motion to help my child, just as I hope those of you that are watching will do the same. Besides naming your emotions, you also want to look and really listen. Understanding what the warning signs are for dyslexia, this can be especially helpful to talk through with other adults and your child's teachers. The Texas Dyslexia Handbook, most recently updated in the fall of 2021, contains guidelines for school districts to follow as they identify and provide services for students with dyslexia. 
This is a resource that has been put out by the Texas State Board of Education and is a wonderful roadmap for parents and educators. One section that Laura and I would like to look at a bit more closely is one that breaks down what dyslexia can look like in a child as they are progressing through grade levels. In preschool, indicators can include a delay in learning to talk, difficulty with rhyming, and even pronouncing some words. Students at this age may also struggle with auditory memory for things like nursery rhymes and chants or adding new vocabulary words. I do not remember my own child with dyslexia ever singing nursery rhymes or really even acknowledging that they existed. My second child, on the other hand, without a learning difference, sang nursery rhymes and chants constantly during this preschool period. Other things to look for, word retrieval, or the ability to recall a word. Pay attention to your students or your child as they have this wonderful coping ability to get to the word they're looking for. One example I like to share is a story about my son. We were buckled up in the car to go to the grocery store and he was about in first grade, maybe second grade, and it was the obligatory, hey, does anyone need anything as we make our journey to the store? Well, there was something that he needed, but it came out as, you know, it's the thing. It's covered in bark, animals live in them, I said, a tree? He, that's it, a tree. I was like, we can't buy a tree at the grocery store, but wait. You take the tree, you take off the bark, then you look into the wood, and that goes to a place where they trim it down, they finish it, and it comes out really nice. Paper, paper was a word he was looking for, but it took us a good five minute drive to the grocery store to get there. That kid needed a notebook. Another red flag includes trouble learning and naming letters, even struggling with the letters in their own name. There can also be an aversion to print. These are the preschoolers that generally do not follow along when you're reading text and can seem very uninterested. In kindergarten and first grade, it can be all of these items that I previously talked about, as well as the following struggles. Difficulty breaking words into smaller pieces. Think about taking the word like baseball and breaking it into syllables, base ball. It can also be a struggle with breaking apart words into their individual sounds. For instance, the word map breaking it into its individual sounds of m, a, p. Difficulty remembering the names of letters and their sounds. We know when this transfers well into first grade and students are still struggling with it, that that can be a red flag. And so then in second and third grade, it's many of those previously mentioned characteristics if no remediation has been provided. You'll also likely really see that difficulty with recognizing common sight words recalling letter combinations and sounds, connecting those sounds with the right letters and spelling. Now when it says difficulty reading fluently, that means it might sound choppy or broken when they're reading. So if you hear a student who's saying like, I need to go, right? It doesn't sound naturally like when we speak, they're having to stop frequently. This is also when you're really going to see that uptick in guessing when they don't know the words. Now in fourth to sixth grade, again, same characteristics as before if no remediation has been provided, but this is when the focus is no longer on learning to read. Children are now expected to read to learn. And so a child who is struggling with reading is now going to be struggling with every subject that uses reading to gain new information. This age group is also when we can really see an impact on vocabulary. Many more multisyllabic words are used, so think Latin, Greek words, um, across the contents, right? Hypotenuse, hypothesis, reflexive. This is going to impact learning the words. That's going to mean they might also have a difficulty spelling the word. And then of course that can lead to just avoiding using the word completely in favor of simpler words. A child who's struggling with decoding in these grade levels is also going to try to get by on listening comprehension. So they're just gonna try to listen and figure out as much as they can about what they need to do in terms of reading and writing just based off of what they've heard. It's a coping skill that many dyslexics can get really good at, but again, it can only get you so far. And the one last thing that I think is really important to touch on with this age group this is when teachers really like to start calling on students to read out loud. A dyslexic child is likely going to have difficulty with that task. And so, and let me just say this, they really shouldn't be required to do it. 
But if they are required to do it, this is when we might start to see those avoidant behaviors, like just flat out refusing to do it or causing a distraction so that they can get out of doing it. Right? And that's developmentally normal. Um, I think about a seventh grader who I worked with who he, every time he went into his reading class, pretty much right off the bat, he'd throw something. And the teacher would send him out in the hall. He'd have like, you know, 10 minutes to cool off. And the cool off worked, right? Because he would come back and participate. Well, what do you think they were doing those first 10 minutes of class? It was a warm up reading drill. Right? And so the conversation needs to be with him, like, hey, what's going on? What can we do to make you feel comfortable with this? Is it um, partnering with a peer who you feel comfortable reading with? Is it letting you record this privately so the teacher can listen later? Right? We've got options, but the conversation, we need to be taking time to have that conversation and get to the bottom of it. Because again, even if I as the adult am like, this shouldn't be something that bothers them, I don't think that we should be bothered by this, it is developmentally normal and we need to meet our students where they are. And then in middle school and high school, again, you'll see many of the same difficulties as before if the child hasn't received any intervention or if they started receiving it late. But the volume of work continues increasing significantly. And so for a child who has dyslexia, it can be completely exhausting. To think about this another way, a child who has dyslexia is likely putting in five to 10 times more effort to complete the same work as their peers. This is when accommodations become critical, and Allison is going to discuss those in more detail later in the presentation. So let's say you found yourself nodding along to some of these risk factors. Maybe you recognize them in your child or even in yourself, right? Because as Allison mentioned, there is a strong familial link with dyslexia. So now it's time to build your knowledge so you can confidently make the best decisions for your child. Okay? There is no one size fits all in terms of supports for dyslexia. You need to be aware of the evidence-based practices so that you can then make informed choices. And a great first step for this is attending Nighthouse Education Center's monthly information session offered at no cost. So we discuss the basics of reading, reading difficulties, especially dyslexia, and we walk through the laws that pertain to dyslexia, both at the federal level and state-specific with Texas. We also, as I mentioned earlier, have dedicated family support coordinators who provide consultations via email or phone, in English and in Spanish. And on the screen, you can see the information to contact us via email or phone. We also have a free booklet entitled, You Can Help Your Child, again, available in English and Spanish, that has a lot of information for you about reading and dyslexia. So you can download the PDF, and then it's also easy for you to share that with other important adults in the child's life, including family members, their teachers, et cetera. And Allison already touched on this earlier, but again, it's worth emphasizing. Another very important resource for you to know as your child's advocate is the Dyslexia Handbook from the Texas Education Agency, also referred to as TEA. This is also available in English and Spanish, and this is the exact information that public schools have. It outlines what all is required for dyslexia support in Texas public schools. It is a comprehensive document. And so I will say, it can be a bit overwhelming if dyslexia and the world of reading terminology is new for you. So again, I would recommend our monthly info session where we walk you through the key information that you would want to be aware of ahead of meetings with your child's school. And then a few other resources, and I do want to note that one of the handouts for this presentation is a bibliography of all the books referenced throughout. And so just know you have access to that document that's going to have all of these resources listed in one place. Overcoming Dyslexia is considered a seminal text by Dr. Sally Shaywitz. This one is also available in audiobook if that's your preference. It very clearly outlines information about dyslexia as well as tools to support learners of all ages and grade levels. So this is a great book whether you are new to this world or even if you already know the basics. Dyslexia Advocate is another book with the goal of walking you through the steps of advocating for your child in the public education space. It can be particularly helpful if the jargon of the public school world, so 504, IEP, ARD, terminology like that is new for you. 
And then lastly, the International Dyslexia Association. They create professionally reviewed brief fact sheets that outline key information on many topics related to dyslexia. They're all available for free. Many of them also have that translation into Spanish. And the topics, it's really a wide variety. You've got accommodations, advocating, gifted and dyslexic. It can be a great way to get started, right? Reading two pages doesn't sound necessarily as overwhelming as reading a whole book. And these fact sheets are also just another great option for you to be aware of if you want to share information with teachers and other key adults in your child's life. And so speaking of the International Dyslexia Association, this is actually a great organization to join. It is a dual membership, and so when you join, you'll also be auto-enrolled into the local branch. And so just to give an example, if you're in the Houston area and you join, you're going to be enrolled in the Houston branch of the International Dyslexia Association. Every branch has its own programming, and so using the Houston branch as an example, they bring in speakers every year and have resources specifically for parents. So it's just a really great way to stay updated on what's going on in the world of dyslexia and to get connected with other people who are on this journey. And I want to leave you with a word of caution. If a resource or intervention seems too good to be true, it probably is. Okay, be warned of quick fixes for dyslexia. If it's claiming to treat dyslexia in the absence of print, these type of remediations have been generally proven to be ineffective. So we've got the examples of colored overlays, special fonts, vision therapy, brain training. Now I will say, right, I had a sixth grader who came to me and he loved his blue color overlay, used it for everything. That's fine, it's not hurting anything, right? As long as I'm aware that that is also not addressing the core difficulty. And so it's fine for him to keep using it, as long as it's also getting coupled with effective evidence-based dyslexia intervention. And so if you have more questions about these approaches or the research showing why they're considered ineffective, the IDA fact sheet, How to Counter Vision-Based Claims About Dyslexia Cures, is a really great resource for that. As part of understanding what dyslexia is, we need to know what the definitions of this disability are. We're going to look at two definitions of dyslexia, one by the Texas Education Agency and the one put out by the International Dyslexia Association. The first one, as defined by TEA, says that dyslexia means a disorder of constitutional origin manifested by difficulty in learning to read, write, spell, despite conventional instruction, adequate intelligence, and sociocultural opportunity. Using the International Dyslexia Association's definition, I put it into a graphic organizer to help you build an elevator speech. I know this is how I remember the definition. As you travel on your dyslexia journey, you and your family are going to become the resident dyslexia authorities on what it is, so be ready with solid information when a neighbor or family member or a teacher asks you about it. So, according to IDA, dyslexia is a specific learning disability, or SLD, that is neurobiological in origin. The difficulties include accurate and or fluent word recognition, spelling, decoding skills, and this is unexpected based on cognitive abilities and instruction. The causes of these difficulties include deficits in the phonological components of phonological awareness, phonological memory, and rapid naming. Secondary consequences can show that there can be a struggle with comprehension because of a reduced reading experience, which can impede students' vocabulary and background knowledge. Now we're going to transition from the focus on empowering you as the adult by processing your emotions and building your knowledge and taking that so you can now focus on empowering your child. And one of the best ways that we can do that is simply by talking with them about what's going on. And the thing is, just like with everything else, right, there's no one-size-fits-all script, okay? Every child with dyslexia is different. Every conversation within a family is going to look different. And so just like everything else, as I'm going through this, if something feels right for you, use it. If it doesn't feel right for you, don't use it, okay? Ultimately, you know what's best, and you should be the one making that final decision. But in my work with students, I found that it was best to just name it, right? To explain dyslexia using kid-friendly language. And oftentimes, with many of the students that I worked with, you know, that initial conversation, it brought a range of emotions. 
But one of the constant emotions, especially with my older students, was to some degree a sense of relief. Because for many of these kids, they had figured out like, hey, I've got things that I'm decent at, right? Even some things that I'm really good at. But for some reason, I can't figure out reading. And it seems like all my classmates had it figured out a long time ago. And so therefore, they draw the conclusion that I must not be smart or I'm dumb. And so to be able to tell them, hey, no, actually, there's nothing wrong with you. Your brain is just fine, OK? You have dyslexia. Let's talk about what this means. And actually, it's associated with a lot of people who are really smart. And guess what? Now that we know what's going on, we can do something about this, OK? It's going to take hard work. Yeah, it might still feel really frustrating, but you absolutely can learn to read. And in my work now, I work with adults as well now. And we have adults who come to us upwards all the way through their 80s who come to us wanting to learn to read. And it's that same thing where, for those who have never known what's going on, for some, the entirety of their life, getting that diagnosis, having an answer, knowing that there is a path forward, it can be truly liberating. And so, again, I say it again because it's important, Every child is different. Every diagnosis is different. No script is going to work for every child. But I am going to offer some guidelines here that you could then consider taking and tailoring to fit your family. All right, so first up, you know, we would just start off. Dyslexia is a fancy word. It means your brain is wired differently. And I like to actually practice saying the words with students. I want them to feel comfortable saying it. And so for some students, if they're having difficulty, that might just look like extending the word dyslexia. And then if it's students who are really having difficulty saying it, we'll break it into syllables. Dyslexia. And we're going to practice that. Again, I just want them to be comfortable with the word. Really, all dyslexia means is that you learn to read and spell differently. And you absolutely can learn to read, right? You just need extra help. And guess what? The reality is everybody needs extra help with different things. Okay, We all have some things that we're better at and some things that are harder for us. And again, you can give examples here beyond school, right? Playing instruments, playing sports, making friends, staying organized. I might even share examples of myself here. And next, what I really want to emphasize here is that those same differences in the brain that make reading and spelling more difficult, those same differences are also what help me to think creatively. And here is where I'd want to share several examples of my child's specific strengths. And also, I can show them examples of people with dyslexia who've been successful with those strengths. And I'm going to give you some specific examples of that on the next slide. I also recommend explicitly letting your child know that they are just as smart as other kids. Many people who have dyslexia are incredibly smart. And then, of course, affirming them and your love for them, making sure they know that you are proud of them. And lastly, I always think it's a good idea to let kids know that it's their choice if they want to share this information with their friends or not. I'm fine if they do, but ultimately it's their decision. The last thought I'll leave you with around discussing dyslexia with your child is know that this is a conversation that's going to continue over time. And your actions as the adult are going to heavily influence how your child ultimately perceives it. So if you normalize talking about it, referencing it, seeing the strengths that come with it, your child is going to normalize that. If you refer to it only briefly and in coded language or only in reference to the difficulties, your child is going to internalize that this is a negative part of them that they shouldn't really talk about. And so again, it comes back to how important it is that you are aware of and have processed your feelings around your child having dyslexia. So I mentioned it can be really great to show your child some examples of dyslexic people who have strengths similar to theirs. Um, and just something to note about this, you know, there are many websites that will claim lots of people have dyslexia, um, even some who claim that famous historical people have dyslexia, such as Albert Einstein. Okay, and we can look at the available information about them and hypothesize, you know, maybe, maybe there was a characteristic or two. Um, but there isn't actually any conclusive evidence. But you know, and this actually, this happened last week. I was talking with a parent and her second grader and he was so excited to tell me that he has dyslexia and Albert Einstein has dyslexia and this was basically his role model because he loves math and this was what he was going to be when he grows up. And that's great, right? There's no problem with that. Um, just know that any information that, that I'm sharing is coming from verified accounts of people who have dyslexia. 
So here we can see um, Kara Knightley, Whoopi Goldberg, they're both actresses. Um, Whoopi Goldberg was actually diagnosed as an adult, and so students who are diagnosed later might find a connection with some of the stories that she has shared about her school experience. Dr. Maggie Adderon Pocock, um, her story is always really fun to share with kids. So she is a scientist and engineer who works as an astronomer. So she studies the stars. And her work is actually so important that she got to meet the Queen of England to talk about it. Richard Branson is also connected with space. And as an entrepreneur, he actually started his first magazine at age 16. Salma Hayek is originally from Mexico. And so she's both bilingual and a famous actress. Dr. Carol Greeter is a scientist who won the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 2009. And this is doubly cool because she is actually only one of 11 women who has won that award since its inception in 1901. And then Tom Holland is usually a hit. Um, he is the actor who plays Spider-Man. And so even though reading was more difficult for him, he's a very gifted actor and athlete. Um, he actually started his audition for Spider-Man by doing a backflip into the room and obviously that worked out well for him. So there are many stories like these available now. Um, many more people are coming forward and sharing, so definitely worth spending some time with your child to learn about some of them. And for a lot of families, using a book can also be a great way to anchor the conversation. Um, and so just a couple disclaimers about this too, right? As I mentioned earlier, there isn't evidence supporting that specific dyslexia fonts are effective in supporting a dyslexic reader. So some newer books are using dyslexia-specific fonts, some books don't. Um, but again, we're not paying attention to the font of the book, we're paying attention to the content. Secondly, no book is perfect. So as we go through these recommendations, just keep in mind, you should always vet a book before reading it with your child to ensure that it communicates the values and message that align with what you think is most important for your child. So with that being said, this book is called, it's called Dyslexia. It's available in English and Spanish, and it really just talks through the basics of what dyslexia is. It's very straightforward. Some other books that you might wanna look into, Magnificent Meg and Did You Say Pagetti, both have conversation starter questions available at the end of the book. If you're so smart, how come you can't spell Mississippi, and Ben and Emma's big hit, both offer perspectives of dyslexia through a narrative. If You're So Smart, How Come You Can't Spell Mississippi is also available on YouTube as a read aloud. And then the last three books were all written and designed by children who have dyslexia. And so that can be nice to hear the child's perspective and to ask your child what they would wanna share if they were going to create a book. Okay, we've got a couple more here. So as I've said, every dyslexic child is unique. I've met many who are visually inclined. These three books under art talents don't necessarily define dyslexia or speak to the dyslexia intervention, but they each highlight a child's artistic and emotional journey and how they use art to process their reading difficulties. And on top of it, they're just all really beautifully illustrated. So the illustrators of A Walk in the Words and Aaron Slater Illustrator both note that they had reading difficulties. And then I do just wanna note um, with Tom's special talent, that is an Irish book. And so some of the spellings of the words reflect that it is from Ireland. There are some books that are appropriate for older children as well. So Dr. Dyslexia Dude is a graphic novel that was always a hit with my middle school students. The Hank Zipser series is a nice chapter book. And then Looking for Heroes is the true story of a dyslexic high school student who wrote to successful people who have dyslexia and they wrote back. Um, and this one is also available as an audiobook, so it could be a fun one to listen to together. Lastly, we have some Spanish options. So you can see Se Llama Dyslexia, Me Cuesta Leer, and a fiction book for older audiences where one of the characters has dyslexia, which is called El Club de los Raros. And here I wanted to highlight some books that were written by dyslexic authors. You can see their names and titles on the screen. Note that many of them have created series. So if your child likes the first one, you have the next ones ready to go. All right, we've spent quite a bit of time looking at different resources to support your ongoing conversations with your child. Now we're going to look at what you need to be aware of to ensure your child has what they need to be successful in the classroom. And so again, this is straight from the Texas Dyslexia Handbook. It says, standard protocol for dyslexia instruction must be evidence-based and effective for students with dyslexia 
taught by an appropriately trained instructor, and implemented with fidelity. Now, when we say fidelity, that means that if the program says it should be 45 minutes to an hour, four to five times a week, that is how it should be implemented. If it's being implemented um, 30 minutes, two times a week, that would not be with fidelity. The handbook also outlines the components that must be included. So when we see phonological awareness, anytime you see PH words with reading, it's talking about sound. Phonological awareness covers identifying and manipulating sounds in different ways. So it could be rhyming, counting words and sentences, syllables, all the way to working with individual sounds. So if I asked a student to say the word man, and then I asked them to replace the sound m mm with b, what word do I have now? Ban. That is a type, it's called phonemic awareness, which is a type of phonological awareness, right? It's playing with individual sounds. Sound symbol association is basically phonics. So knowing, for example, that the letters OI are always going to say OI. Syllabication is referring to being able to break words into their syllable types to help determine how to pronounce them. Morphology is word parts, so you can think um, prefixes, suffixes. Syntax, think grammar, nouns, and verbs. And then we have reading comprehension, fluency, and of course, written expression. The handbook again emphasizes the importance of the interventionist being highly trained and being enabled to implement the program with fidelity. Additionally, they should use evidence-based practices such as simultaneous multisensory. So that is, stands for visual, auditory, kinesthetic, and tactile, right? This enhances the memory and the learning. Systematic and cumulative, we want to follow the order of the language. Explicit instruction, we're going to demonstrate one concept at a time. Teaching to automaticity, we're not going to move on until the child has mastered it. And we're going to use both synthetic and analytic instruction. So we're learning different approaches to figuring out words by looking at parts to create a whole, and then looking at the whole and breaking it into parts. What I know and have witnessed in my own career is that dyslexia is a disability of privilege. If you happen to have access to extra money in the family budget to pay for a private tutor, then that could be a viable option for you. Maybe you could opt for a private school that specializes in disabilities. Not everyone has access to that. My family did not. That is how I ended up taking classes at Nye House Education Center so I could help my own child. It worked out for our family and for my career path, but that is not viable for everyone. So, what is your other option? Be an advocate for your child and every other student that may have a reading disability on your child's public school campus. Don't discount your local public school. Work on partnering with them. Every campus is different. Using the information that Laura just went over about what dyslexia instruction should look like, see what they can provide. Ask to watch a lesson. Ask about the training that the reading specialist has had and what program they will be using with your child. Some campuses do a beautiful job of providing top-notch interventions for your child, while others fall short. Ask the questions and make an informed decision based on what is in front of you at that moment. Every semester, reassess what is working and what is not. Maybe you get solid remediation in early elementary school, but then when your child is in middle school, they seem to be slipping in comprehension. Revisit. Work on those weaknesses as you come across them in real time. Every family is different. Every school is different. What can your school provide? Instructional accommodations. These are changes to materials, actions, or techniques, including the use of technology, that enable students with disabilities to participate meaningfully in grade level or course instruction. The use of accommodations occurs primarily during classroom instruction as educators use various instructional strategies to meet the needs of each student. A student may need an accommodation only temporarily while learning a new skill or a student may require the accommodation throughout the school year and over several years, including beyond graduation. Decisions about which accommodations to use are very individualized and should be made for each student by that student's ARD or Section 504 committee, along with the student once they understand what accommodations are available to them and what they are comfortable using. Let's talk about testing accommodations. Educators, parents, and students must understand that accommodations provided during classroom instruction and testing might differ from accommodations allowed to use on state assessments. Here in Texas, that would be the STAR. The state assessment is a standardized tool for measuring every student's learning in a reliable, valid, and secure manner. An accommodation used in the classroom for learning may invalidate or compromise the security or integrity of the state assessment. 
technology can serve your student well if they are given the time and proper instructions on how to use it prior to incorporating it into their schoolwork. My own child's favorites were Learning Ally and Audible for access to textbooks and just regular books. Dragon Speech, which is a speech to text software. This was a good one. You have to take the time though to learn the software program and have it recognize your child's voice in order for it to really be effective. Grammarly, this was an absolute lifesaver for my child in college and still he uses it. The different spellings and meanings of words like to, T-O or T-O-O or T-W-O, it helps them choose the correct one in context. He uses it in his workplace now for emails and reports and it has helped him become a more confident and comfortable written communicator. My suggestion is that you prioritize and have your child prioritize two to three accommodations to help them be successful in the classroom. Okay, so we've talked through providing supports inside the classroom. Now we're going to transition to talking about those supports outside of the classroom. What else we can do in addition to having that initial conversation with our child? The book, The Dyslexic Advantage, is a great resource for adults because it presents the benefits and strengths of dyslexia. So this book walks through the different types of strengths that tend to present with people who have dyslexia. They give you examples of look-fors, and you will, again, likely find yourself nodding along as you read about characteristics that stand out to you. So the M stands for material reasoning. People who have a material reasoning strength are, are 3D thinkers, okay? They're very visual and they enjoy building things. So I think of a fifth grader who I work with who had his notebook, his invention notebook, and it was everything from he had invented a grabber um, to help his mom get things, all the way to at one point he showed me um, he had his invention that he was going to show to the government about some new high-tech military inventions, okay? So it spanned the whole thing. And even just recently, his mom actually sent me, he created a movie trailer and I kid you not it looked like it could have been on the big screen right very talented kid puts his imagination to work in amazing ways he's a creator right and so people who have this strength many times go on to be architects builders surgeons and so just to quickly review the others interconnected reasoning is a strength with systems connection and relationships so I think big picture thinkers here actors scientists chefs Narrative reasoning is a strength with storytelling, musicians, CEOs, politicians. So here I think of the narrative book that I mentioned earlier, Ben and Emma's Big Hit. It was written by the governor of California, right? A dyslexic politician who has that storytelling strength. And then dynamic reasoning is a strength of going into the future and past. So accountants, doctors, farmers, traders, being able to use the past to think through the future. Now along the same wavelength as The Dyslexic Advantage, which is for adults, here are two books that were written for children. So Lexi Diaz and The Power of Dyslexia would be for a very young early elementary audience. Extraordinary People was created by the British organization Made by Dyslexia. What I love about this book is that it names that people with dyslexia do have some challenges, but really the focus of the book is on different types of strengths that people with dyslexia normally have. So you can see the example on the screen, storytellers. So it describes their strengths, their common professions. So again, a lot of alignment with the dyslexic advantage, but in kid-friendly language. I've even used this book to talk with other kids who don't have dyslexia about what it means to have dyslexia and strengths that go with it. Finding young dyslexic role models can be powerful as well. So this first example is Matthew. At age 14, he developed a sandpaper-like writing pad that actually goes on top of a tablet. So he was providing a multi-sensory experience for students who had dyslexia as they were learning their Chinese characters. He actually won the Bronze Award at the 2018 Asian International Innovation Award where he was the only teen contestant. And then we also have MICA. So every year, the International Dyslexia Association recognizes a dyslexic student. She was recognized for her athletic abilities as a squash champion and her advocacy to get squash added as a future Olympic sport. And again, it can always be helpful to have books that have strong characters who also have dyslexia. So both of these books are also available as audiobooks. The male protagonist of The Lightning Thief has dyslexia, as does the female protagonist in The Fish in the Tree. One of the gifts you can give your child is to be comfortable talking about your own strengths and weaknesses. These note cards are ones that my students did with me that includes their fingerprint to remind them of their uniqueness and their individuality. 
Then there is a list of strengths, the things that they feel like they're pretty good at, and a list of weaknesses, things that they feel they could use some help with or just in general are harder for them to do. Strengths on these cards include everything from cooking to martial arts to driving, yes, this is from a middle school student, or just being a good friend. Every weakness that they wrote or I scribed for them was reading. It is almost a relief to say, yeah, this is hard, but guess what? These are skills that I can get better at and I can become a more fluent reader. What if your child is struggling to find something that is a strength for them? You search far and wide. You have to find something that does not relate to grades or testing or an academic measure of success for students that struggle. Examples include sports, any sports, doesn't have to be related to school. Raise an animal for the FFA chess or checkers or other gaming pursuits, race car driver, there are wonderful simulation programs. Maybe they wanna go and visit lots of museums. Create a blog or podcast. Artist, I had many that did everything from lighting to photography to musical instruments. Be a chef, woodworking, builder, contractor. Do not limit or punish your child based on grades or school-related actions. Instead, look at your child as a holistic being that has talents, as well as a disability. Foster their confidence and spirit. Do not just focus on academics all the time. My own child played basketball. It kept him motivated and energized to get through school. He did know he had to keep his grades up in order to play in middle school, high school, and college, but it gave him the energy to keep going. He was even able to keep playing to get his master's degree. He learned to advocate for himself in high school and college, to meet with the Student Support Center on campus every semester to plan out and get permission for his accommodations. Then he had to take a letter to each of his professors and ask directly for those accommodations. He had to schedule the times in the reading labs to take tests for extended time. He had to do it. This is why I urge parents and teachers to work with their child or student to have them advocate for those pieces that can help them be successful in the classroom. It can be done. Here's a video of my oldest, Jeremy Peck. He sat down and did an interview with his sister asking the questions. He's usually pretty reserved about sharing his experiences, but when I told him what this was for, he agreed to share from his heart to help other students that have also been diagnosed with dyslexia. Hello, I'm Jeremy Peck, and I was diagnosed with dyslexia when I was six years old. I'm currently 24 and just graduated with my master's of management. Before that, I had my bachelor's degree in business management. What was it like growing up with dyslexia? I think when you're diagnosed with dyslexia, it can be kind of a shock at first. Um, but once you get into it and learn a little bit more about it, because uh, when you're young, you don't quite fully understand what it is and, and kind of the process uh, that happens afterwards because everyone learns differently and everyone must adapt to it. And they, everyone has their own dyslexic brain and learning differently can really help you out. Um, and outside of you know going and getting extra reading and learning more with tutors and focusing on on all that you also need an outside hobby that can help you you know manage your time and you know something to look forward to after um, school so what did you find the most helpful navigating through school so i found two things helpful motivation and accommodations so starting with motivations um, kind of what I touched on before is having an outside hobby. So for me, it was basketball. I always looked forward to, to that after school, but first once I got my homework and everything and my studies and tutoring done. Next, I had accommodations. Um, I, I'll be the first to admit that I was a bit nervous and hesitant using accommodations. I didn't use them until later in high school and in college. And once I did, it helped me out a lot. And I think being able to come forward and understanding what accommodations you need the most um, you know, they give you a wide range and list from it, but figure out what works best for you. It always works, you know, it goes back to what works best for you. And then going from there and using those for high school, college um, will be really helpful. How did you progress as a learner from elementary school all the way to now? Yeah, when I found out um, in elementary school, I was not a fan of school. Uh, whenever language arts came around, uh, you know, I didn't want to participate and it kind of was discouraging. Um, we always had reading levels and you know when, when you're with a friend group and your reading levels are lower than everyone else it can kind of be a talking point and you know you, you're having to learn extra outside of school you're getting pulled from classes working with your tutor reading more and more um which can be discouraging but once you grow up going to middle school and you start to understand what works best for you and working and learning for me like audiobooks i listen to audiobooks and that helped me speed up my reading and learning um through school and all the way up through your accommodations um, I think when I started off, reading was one of my, 
you know, weakest points. And by the end, um, you know, following and working hard and understand what works best for you is one of my strengths. And also, once you're done with school and you start your career, you still fall back on what helped you get um, to where you are in terms of learning and your accommodations. And then now I still use that every single day um, to help me build and continue to grow. What advice would you give to students who are recently diagnosed with dyslexia? No, I think when you're recently diagnosed, um, it can be kind of a shock, but also a relief. Um, so you can build up, build your support system, um, you know, help them help advocate, and you can really learn and understand what it is. And then as you continue to grow, you can become your own advocate and, you know, advocate at school or with counselors. Um, but I really would say, you know, don't be discouraged. When I found out, you know, I thought I was, you know, not smart. I didn't understand what was going on. And then once I was able to kind of understand it and work with my tutor, work with outside sources and work, you know, with the school, it really helps you. Um, and I can say that it's continuously learning. You know, when it starts off, it's going to be tough. It's going to be really hard. But in the end, it'll be, a, it'll be so rewarding when you get to college and you're able to work hard and understand you know, what works for you and then really excel at that. I mean, look at me, I have a master's and I work in the medical device industry and I would have never thought that this is where I would have been, you know, 10 years ago. What a great example of empowerment that was. Now we wanna take a few minutes to transition into considering what to do if, despite your best efforts, your child is still having significant difficulties. These difficulties could come from a variety of sources. And so one of the top concerns families contact us about is their child's anxiety. Especially if a child received a later diagnosis, they might have had significant time of struggling with reading without adequate support. They might still be carrying anxiety about reading and about school in general. It's valid. And it's really important to pay attention to your child's cues, pay attention to what you're sensing, and to seek additional support if this is something that you're noticing. Behavior also comes up, sometimes around students resisting using accommodations, especially older students or those who are diagnosed late. Sometimes it's a complete resistance to reading. And then there's also adult burnout, feeling exhausted by all the things you're trying to do to support your child, not having a support network or people who you feel like you can talk to or who get it, and adult resistance other important adults in the child's life who still might not be comfortable with your child's diagnosis or who might not be aligned with you in terms of what your child needs to be successful. And sometimes that can also look like difficulty having open communication with school personnel. And while I truly believe that the vast majority of parents and educators do want what is best for the child, sometimes what they believe is best can differ and that can be a really difficult conversation to have. So if any of these barriers resonate with you, please know that you are not alone. All right, so as I mentioned earlier, the International Dyslexia Association, if you're local, the Houston branch of the International Dyslexia Association, is a great way to get connected. They also produce an annual resource guide with lots of helpful information. Our Nighthouse Education Center website has many resources. The Yale Center for Dyslexia and Creativity has a lot of great stories of successful people with dyslexia. Understood.org also has success stories and information about other learning differences as well. Reading Rockets is going to have a lot of information about supporting reading. And then Wright's Law is more specific to special education and interpreting testing. I also encourage you to sign up for the Nighthouse Family Newsletter. You will get information about upcoming events this way. As I mentioned earlier, our monthly info session covers the basics. Once a semester, we host a public virtual dyslexia simulation. Now, the thing is, if you don't have dyslexia, you can't fully understand what it means to have it. However, this simulation helps to create a sense of the feelings of frustration, anxiety, failure that students are many times feeling. We have used it with parents and educators, and almost always we get feedback that people are going to change their approach to be more compassionate and patient with their dyslexic students. College Share and College Panel are annual events that are geared to giving information for dyslexic students headed to college. College Panel in particular is pretty neat because current college students with dyslexia come to speak about their experiences and answer questions. So again, if you sign up for our newsletter, that is the best way to stay up to date about upcoming events. And of course, 
please don't hesitate to contact our Family Support Office. Okay, the information is on the screen and we are always here and ready to help. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you found some nuggets of information that will work for you and your family. And remember, you can empower your dyslexic child. Thank you.